No, I don't consider myself a legend. I'm just a happy person that can do what they want to do. Charlie Deal was a man with an absolute dream that no one else believed in but himself. And he made it a reality. He had the spirit of rock and roll. He just, he adored rock and roll. We all adored rock and roll. I think that people realized what a rare creature he really was. Because we were living in, a, in a, certainly in a time, in a modern age, which values uh, professionalism. And he was a total throwback to just something completely different. When I was three or four years old, I wanted to be a guitar maker. And I was afraid to tell anybody. Because if you live in northern Minnesota and everybody's a dairy farmer, they all expect their kids to be dairy farmers. In the 50s and early 60s, there was a huge working class population. The kids were really tough. Uh, that was uh, actually the world Charlie came into in uh, Mill Valley. Then after everybody started taking acid and smoking pot and getting really cool, then Mill Valley got really cool. And that's when Charlie started developing his, his thing, you know. So his persona of being a craftsman and a uh, guitar builder along with a significant musician became uniquely Charlie Deal. I made one for a comedy act, a horrible comedy act. I applied for a patent in 1965, and I was rejected the first time around because they said I was only modifying the toilet seat. And I had to prove I wasn't going to sell them as toilet seats. Charlie had this kind of uh, obsessive, mad scientist feel to him. Uh, like he was obsessed with his work, uh, very animated about his art, which was making toilet seat guitars. And not something everybody thinks to do, right? And originally, I couldn't give them away. And everybody in town was laughing at me and thought I was screwy. And I was five cents short. Well, I mean, the reason is that they weren't really good guitars then. But it took him a few years to really learn how to make a good instrument. I would say probably somewhere in the mid-70s he had it down. But that was 10 years after he'd started making them. Most of the time before 85, I actually would make it into a guitar, you know, like I would actually wire up the pickup and, you know, put the bridge on so, make, just make the guitar so it could work. He gave me my first uh, paying job as a, in the guitar repair world. This was one of my very early ones. That was number three. Well, this one here is a, a left-handed guitar and it's called the Reverse Flush. I can never make two of them identical. And you're trying to show them that you're giving them personalized service. In, in a society that doesn't always want to give personalized service. A lot of people invested in guitars, more in Charlie than the guitar. The hope was that you would see delivery. And when you get tired, you just close the door of the shop and leave, or you get bored, you can always come back. The work will wait for another day. Yes, well, Garcia had to wait five years for his guitars. Yeah, you had to wait five years to get a guitar made. I told a customer, how come you're not different than Jerry Garcia? And then she says, in what way? And I told her, and then she says, oh. It was, yeah, it's all a question of how much the people bugged him, you know? And he, there was times when he would like go into a, into a bar or restaurant and see somebody who he was behind on their guitar and turn around and head the other way. <laughs> and I made one for the 2 a.m. club which made it to the front and back of Huey's number one selling album. That really put him on the map for national life recognition. You know, so many things were going right for him in that period of the 80s and stuff. And he'd become an icon not just of, uh, of himself and his personality, and he had become an icon of Mill Valley itself. I do think that was a very significant thing for Charlie. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Evening Magazine for Tuesday night. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm Jonathan Karsh, and here is what is on the show tonight. You're going to enjoy it. One of the greatest things that happens on Evening Magazine is when we find a true Bay Area character. Well, we found a character, all right, a legend in his hometown of Mill Valley. He's the only one in the world that does what he does for a living. And the folks in Mill Valley call him Toilet Seat Charlie.
He was the oral repository of Marin County music in a lot of ways for like stuff that happened like back in the late 50s, early 60s. And so and so was in this band and they did this and they did that. And he would talk about this as if it happened yesterday. Who is this band? No, it wasn't the Charlatans, and it wasn't uh, Van Morrison. We had a. <laughs> it wasn't any of those people. It was Charlie Deal. Charlie felt that uh, music was his calling, and he started forming up bands with all kinds of weird assortments of characters and just general misfits and that kind of thing. But that's back when bands had suits, and they had moves they would do. He learned all his moves. He, he had his moves down better than his guitar playing. He would stand on top of his amp. And he was a little guy, just a little guy, five foot nothing. He would stand up there and do his guitar moves and bring down the house. And a lot of times his guitar would be turned down. They wouldn't even hear him, but he would be the star of the show. <laughs> so we'd be on D and he'd still be back in G. So there's no way we could send his information out into the crowd. <laughs> Charlie's Gang becoming kind of an institution as an opening act. The material stayed pretty much the same. Uh, 60s rock and roll, pure and simple. And it was really good, it was really powerful. If you went to hear him, you would dance and have a really good time. But once again, Charlie is not plugged in. And I think he knew it. You knew that he was purely into the performance. And he just loved it because people enjoyed it. Because here, you know, here, is the, here are these guys, you know, these, these musicians are, you know, kind of posturing. Kind of like, you know, how young musicians are, you know, just kind of throwing a shape. I'm living large, I'm little You know, and he's just sitting there beaming like just this little angel, you know, smiling, you know, and doing these little mad acts, you know. And so you always enjoyed that. For Charlie Deal, folks. Come on, that's it! Charlie Deal! Hey, Charlie! Have you seen Bernice? We had our punk rock band, Wet Nurse. We followed spontaneity totally. And we turned Charlie up really loud. And we just followed what he was doing. He played with such a style of anarchy. We totally understood it. We totally accepted it. We totally backed him. And we're sitting there playing this stuff. And uh, he just looks at us like he's nuts because it doesn't sound like real rock and roll, you know. Charlie would just be, he'd be going like, dun 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 or whatever he was doing. It was, it was illogical. It didn't make sense according to the formal music, and we were right there with him doing it, and and it really freaked him out. And I, I play because I want to play, not because I have to play. And, and I don't try to be a star or anything, I just like playing. He had become almost a caricature and that he was beginning to realize that he had created something that publicly he needed to maintain. The town really did embrace him in a way that I've never seen before. Certainly not since. Everyone would know him. Charlie! To say he was a fixture would be putting it lightly, but for me he was the unofficial mayor of Mill Valley because everyone knew him. He was an old-fashioned gentleman in a lot of ways. And it, even though he was on one side that and the other side a little wisecracking guy with bad jokes, I always felt that he had respect for the rest of the human race. The rest of the audience would just sort of fade away and there'd be this Charlie sitting on his bar stool back there with his stick all hunched over. And uh, he was just uh, 
it just it just it just felt like um, old Mill Valley. <laughs> when Alta California was a place where you had farmers, craftsmen, small shopkeepers, that culture, that world, he was a touchstone to that. Okay, not the the current Marin is a professional ghetto, for lack of a better term. But Charlie was able to ride it out because, uh, you know, he had established himself and, and he was kind of like a little island of old time sanity in the middle of this changing world. The Times needed someone like Charlie to really have a sense that there was a kindler, gentler time um, that where rock and roll was king. <laughs> up there and I looked down and if there was a blonde that was over 5'8 and it was 90% blonde and they were all stacked you know it's like and Charlie would be right breast level and he would be he just a smile on his face and he'd be dancing and it was great it was just like hello Nirvana has come to get me